Hi. So here, let's jump into the code for the operator module. So the first thing is we're going to have to import the operator module. So we can simply do an import operator to import the entire module. If you just want specific items from operator, just, you know, say from operator import, whatever you want to import. So however you want to do it. You can also look at what's inside. You can do a help on operator or you can do a dir to see all the um, attributes. And you can see the ones that we've talked about in the lecture. We have add, there's an absolute value. You have the and, the Boolean and. You've got attribute getter, concat, contains, count of, delete item, you know, the equality equals equals is eq, floor div, and so on. And there's a bunch of others as well. Um, you know, you've got the floor division, you have now these ones with like i power or i add and so on. We'll look at that later in the section on object oriented programming. These are basically the in place. So for example, I add is the equivalent, the functional equivalent to the plus equals operator. And of course, these actually, although we think that they behave like a equals a plus one, the plus equals actually can behave a little differently. And we'll get into the details of that, into the nitty gritty details of that later on in this course. But that's what those are, and that's why you you have the I in front for the in place operators. Uh, you have a bunch of other ones like uh, I true, well I true div, but you also have true div, which is the real division. You know, you've got the XOR power and so on. So let's start taking a look at some of the arithmetic operators just to see how it works. So for example, if we want to add, let's say two numbers, well we can say one plus two, right? We can write it that way if I can type it. 1 plus 2, but we can also call it using a method, um, using a function, I should say, operator dot add 1 comma 2. And that returns the sum of 1 and 2. So it's just a functional equivalent to the plus. We have that for multiplication, so we can say operator dot mul, let's say 2 and 3, that will get us 6. You can do operator dot true division. 3 and 2, that will get us 1.5. You can say operator dot um, floor division. Let's say 13 and 2, that should return 6, right? So we get 6. That's the same thing as saying 13 div 2, like so. You have the mod operator and so on. So there's a bunch of these arithmetic operators that are available. Uh, you can certainly look at the documentation, see what's there, or just do the dir or a help on the module and you'll get information there as well. So why this? Where, it, where can it be useful? Well, think back to what we did in the last uh, lecture. Well, not the, this lecture on the, the operator module, but on the higher order functions and the reduce, for example, or the map, right? We were passing in functions and we were creating our, la our own lambdas to add two things together or to multiply two things together, two variables together. So let's see how we might use that. So let's go ahead and from func tools, let's import just reduce. That's what we need from there. So let's import that. And let's think back to one of the previous examples that was very simple. We want to, let's say, multiply all the items in a list, right? So we created a Lambda that took in two parameters, X and Y, and it just returned X times Y. And then we passed in a list, let's say one, two, three, and four, right? And this gave us 1 times 2, which is 2 times 3, which is 6 times 4, which is 24. So we have 24. So think back to the lecture that we had on reduce. But you'll notice that we had to create this lambda function here. And all it really did was really make a functional equivalent of the multiplication operator. Well, that's what the operator module gives us. So we don't have to do that. Instead, we can just say operator.mul. And then we'll pass in one, two, three, and four as well. And we get the same result. So you can see where this might be useful. Basically, it gives you a functional equivalent. So you can use that wherever you would need that functional equivalent. You don't have to write your own def you know, definition for a function, your own def or lambda, however you want to do it. Now, we also have comparison operators. So again, you could say operator less than is 10 less than 3 the answer is false right 10 is not less than 3. Uh, you also have the is now the is of course is going to be uh, with the underscore just so it doesn't clash with the built-in is function 
and the reason why you might think, well, how can it clash, right? I'm saying operator.is. Well, remember, you can say from operator import is. And now I can just use is by itself. I don't have to prefix it with operator because I've imported it directly. If the name had been is, then that's going to clash with the built-in is um, operator in Python. So is, let's say, is ABC uh, the same as DEF? And of course, the answer would be false, right? What about is of ABC and ABC? Remember about interning all the way back to the beginning of the course? Remember about Python interning strings for us? So in this case, ABC and ABC are indeed the same object, not just the same values. You can also look at the truthiness. Uh, there's a dot truth function. So you can say operator dot truth and you pass in, let's say, an empty list. That should get us false. Empty lists are falsy. And you can do the same thing. Uh, but passing in, let's say, a list that has at least one element and then the value is true. It's truthy because it has a, uh, an element. It's not an empty list. Okay, so that's, those are pretty straightforward, right? They're just functional equivalents to what we've seen before. So let's look at attribute and element getters and setters because those can be a little bit more interesting and a little bit more complicated as well. So let's start with a list. Let's say my list equals one, two, three, four, okay? Now I've got this list and I can request an element at a specific index. So it's a sequence type. So let's say I want my list uh, at, and I want the element at index one. Well, that's gonna return two, right? It's this element right here. Okay, now sometimes though, we need to be able to do this using kind of more of a functional call. So how do we do that? Well, that's by using the get item in um, uh, function in the operator module. So we would say operator dot get item and get item is going to be, it's going to take my list and I want item number one. So at index one and we get two. So we get the same thing. So this and this are essentially equivalent. Now, if the sequence is mutable, we can also set or remove items. So the same thing can be done here. So let's say we want to say my list. Now this is a mutable, right? It's a list, it's mutable. So I can set my list equal to 100, right? And now I can print my list out and you can see that we changed the second element to 100. Um, well, we can also go ahead and delete something. So we can say delete my list three. So we'll delete the last item, right? Zero, one, two, three. We're going to delete the last item. So now if we look at my list, we're left with one, 103. We deleted four from there. So these are operations that we can do on sequences. We'll come back to them when we do sequence types in more detail. But of course, we can do the same operations using the operator modules functions. So here, let me redefine my list again equal to, we'll start with the same list as before, one, two, three, four. But now I'm gonna say operator dot set item. So I wanna set an item in my list. I wanna set the, which item? We set the item number one at index one. So one, and we set it to a value of 100. So let's go ahead and do that. And now let's print my list out again. And as you can see, just as before, now we have 100 in the second position. We can also delete an item using the same technique. So we can say operator dot delete item. Now we want to delete an item from my list and we want to delete the last item. In this case, it was uh, position number three. So three. Yeah, if I can type. <laughs> Eventually I'll get it right. There we go. Operator dot del item. So delete item from my list at position three. So now if we look at my list, what do we have? We have the same thing as before. We actually removed the last element. So again, these are functional equivalents to what we were doing here with indexing, right? And either getting or setting these uh, values. Okay, so we did the set item, delete item and get item. But the get item returns a value. It actually takes two parameters. It 
takes the object, the sequence type we're interested in, and the index that we're interested in, and returns the actual element at that position. Right? So it returns the value. Now the value, of course, could be a function. If your sequence happens to contain functions, well, it will return a function. Right? But it's going to return that element. So there's a thing where, if you think back to partial functions that we did before, right? So get item requires two arguments. It requires the object and it requires the index. Well, we have this thing in the operator module called the item getter. So item getter, think of it as a partial function, which where you specify the index, but you don't specify the list. So that will come later. So that's why I, we can think of this as a partial, essentially. So how do we do this? Let's go ahead and I'm going to assign it to a variable for now. So we're going to say operator dot item getter. So item getter is something that will get an item and it will get the item at position two. But of course, f, if you look at f, f is a function, right? f is not a value. It's actually a function. It's an operator item getter, but that's a, that's of type function. So it's a callable, essentially. So we need to call it. But we can't call it with nothing. That's going to say, well, no, because item getter expected one argument and got zero. Yes, remember, if it's a partial function, it still needs this object here. So let's go ahead and let's uh, redefine my list again. And let's say we want to get f of my list and we get three. Because remember, what was f? It was item getter. 2. So 0, 1, 2 is the value 3. So that's what got returned. Now, of course, if we have s equals python, we can say f of s and we'll get t, 0, 1, 2, right? This is the item at position 2. So item getter f will get the element at position 2 for whatever gets passed in. So this can be quite useful. We'll see that when we look at some examples of how to apply this, let's say, to sorting. Right? And we'll see how, where that's useful. The next thing also that I want to point out with item getter that we saw in the lecture is that you can have more than one argument in item getter. It takes a variable number of arguments. So let's take a look. Let's say that f equals operator dot item getter. And let's say we want item number at position two and item at position three. So again, if we look at type of f, it's not a value, it's a function, it's a callable, right? It's an item getter callable. And it's now still waiting to be called with whatever object we want to pass it. So let's say we say my list equals one, two, three, four, okay? And now we can call f of my list and we get the tuple three and four because we got items two and three, right? If I did items one, two, and three, then we get two, three, and four, right? So we can pass in as many as we want. Obviously, if you pass in more, let's say I say I want, you know, two, three, and four, right? Then when we apply it to here, we're gonna get an index out of range because two and three are okay, but four is not. So just be careful with that, right? There's no magic here. The item's not available, it's still gonna fail. Okay. So let's change that back to one. Well, let's just change it back to two and three. Okay. And of course, if we apply this to, you know, we applied this to my list, right? We did that and we got items three and four, but of course we can apply this to a string, right? We can say F applied to Python that will give us T and H, right? It's the same thing. It's just whatever sequence type gets passed in. Now, the attribute getter that we saw in the lecture works, it's kind of similar to item getter, but item getter, if you think about it, it's taking an index. Attribute getter, on the other hand, is going to work with objects and it's going to look for attribute names. So it's going to basically take in strings as parameters, not integers, which are representing indices. So let's start and let's define a very simple class. Let's say my class, and we're going to initialize the class. Um, so in the um, when we're initializing, we'll create three properties: a, b, and c, set to 
10, 20, and 30 respectively. Okay, so that's that. And then we're also going to define, so now this class has three attributes, which are properties, A, B, and C. We're also going to create one more attribute, which is going to be a method. And it's just going to do this. It's going to say test method running. Okay, so that's all that method does. It's just going to print out test method running. So very, very simple class. Now let's see how we might be able to retrieve those values and invoke that function using the attribute getter function in the module operator, in the operator module, sorry. So let's go ahead and create an object as an instance of my class. So now we have object. So <clears throat> object is an instance of my class and it has properties like A, it has a property like B, right? It also has a property called test, right? And you can see it's just telling you, hey, this is a bound method of my class dot test to this object object here, right? So it's an instance method. It hasn't called it. You'll notice that it just tells me, hey, this is what got returned. Test is a callable. In order to call it, I have to put these parentheses in. Now it calls that method and now we can see test method running. So I just wanted to really point out the difference between this and this. This returns the method. This calls the method. Okay. So now let's see how we might do that using the operator module, using the attribute getter. So attribute getter takes a string as a parameter. And in this case, I know that I have an attribute called A. So I'm just going to pass in this string and the string will contain the name of the attribute that I'm looking for. In this case, the property A. So if I do that, I'm going to get this. Now, this is a callable, right? Because have I specified which object I want to get the attribute A for? No. So this is like item getter. It's returning a callable. This thing is a callable. It needs to know which object do you want to apply this to? So let's go ahead and give it a name. Let's say uh, property A. Okay, let's call it that. Now I need to call it, but I need to call it telling it which object I'm interested in. I'm going to tell it, well, I'm interested in object OBJ. And so when I do that, now I get the value 10 back. Okay, obviously I cannot call it this way. It will complain saying, no, you can't just like we saw with item getter. So attribute getter is no different. I have to tell it which object. So you might say, well, why, you know, I mean, why, why can't I just say, you know, obj.a? Well, what happens if let's say the property name, right? Or the property that you're interested in returning, let's say in your program is dependent on something else. Maybe it's installed in a variable and the variable contains the property name. So let's say my var equals b. And now I want to return object dot, well, what can I do? Can I say object dot my var? Well, the answer is no, because my class, right, this, this object, right, doesn't have a property called my var. Python is looking for a property called my var, just like when I say a, it's looking for the property called a. So I can't do that. Instead, what I could do, though, is I could do it this way. I can use the attribute getter. Attribute getter just wants a string. So that's okay. I'm giving it the string and that's now going to return. You can see attribute getter for B. It's the same thing as if I typed in and hard coded the value B in there, except now the property name I'm interested in is stored in a variable. So that could be useful in certain circumstances. Now, obviously this doesn't actually get called. It's a callable and I need to tell it which object I'm interested in when I actually want to get that. So I can either call it directly this way, or if I want and I need to reuse it multiple times, I may say property B or property my, well, actually property B in this case. Okay. Because once the attribute getter is created, be careful. If you change my var later on to C, this attribute getter callable called prop B isn't going to magically change, right? So let's, let's actually see that. Let's say prop B of OBJ. Okay. We get 20 back. Now let's say I set my var equal to C. Okay. So if I do that and then I call prop B of OBJ, 
I'm not going to get the value for C back, which was 30. I'm still getting 20 back. So just be a little bit aware of that. Okay. All right. Um, also, attribute getter can take in more than one. So we can look at operator dot attribute getter. Let's say A and B applied to object B to uh, object OBJ, and we get 10 and 20 back. So you can satisfy multiple things, right? And if you want, you could even say A comma B comma, and here I'm going to call it uh, test equals, and here I'm going to say I'm looking for the attribute test. Okay, so A is 10, B is 20, and what's test? Well, test is that method again. So if we want, we can call it like this, right? But remember this test method here, this callable here, that's assigned to the variable name test is actually the test method that's bound to this object here because it would specific to that object. All right. So of course, a lot of that stuff you can do using lambdas as well, right? You can always say lambda um, x returns x dot a right and we give that a name right and now we can say f of obj you can do that as well in this way in this way as you know equivalently it's no different same thing with item getter if you want you can say f equals lambda x return x of two for example so now if x equals one two three four we can call f of x that's going to return three or maybe you want to do the same thing that item getter does or attribute getter does with multiple values. Well, you could say something like this, return x2 and x3, right? So what are we going to return here? We're actually returning a tuple, right? So we can define it this way. And now when I do that, I get three, four back, right? I get items two and three. So obviously you can use your own Lambda functions as well, wherever you want. In some cases though, using the operator module might be a little easier. Let's look at a use case. Let's look at sorting. So let's look at sorting where, let's say we have uh, complex numbers. So recall the lecture on complex numbers. Let's say we have a complex number, a equals five plus 10 J, right? So a is just this complex number here, five plus 10 J. Now a has a real part, which is five. Also has an imaginary part, which is 10. So suppose we have a list that contains multiple complex numbers and we want to sort them based on the real part of the numbers. So maybe we have five minus uh, 10j, we have three plus 3j, and then maybe we have uh, two minus 100j, okay? So here we have this list and we want to sort L. Now we can't just call sorted, right? Because Complex numbers don't support less than or greater than. There's no way to do that. So we saw that what we could have done, and we did that in the past before, we used, let's say, the distance of the um, complex number from the origin. That was one way of sorting. Here, I just want to sort based on the real part. So I want, basically, I want this to be sorted uh, in increasing order based on the real part. So two, three, and five. So what should my key be? Well, my key needs to be something that's going to return the real part. So I can certainly do this. I can say x and then look at x.real. So now if we do that, that's sorted properly as we expected, 2, 3, and 5. You'll notice there. Of course, we don't have to use lambda. Instead, we can use the operator. And what are we looking for? Well, in this case, we're looking for the attribute called real. So we can say attribute getter real that's another way of doing this now remember attribute getter returns a callable which is expecting the number that get that's going to get passed in which is exactly what key wants it wants a function here that takes a single parameter just like our lambda did so if we do this we get the same result now you may also have another use case let's say you have a bunch of lists that or a list that contains a bunch of tuples let's say well, a bunch of lists, doesn't matter. Let's say we have two, three, four, um, one, three, five. Maybe we have um, six just by itself. Um, 
and maybe we have, um, I don't know, four and a hundred, okay? So this is our list, and we want to sort these tuples based on the first item of each tuple. So again, we can just say sorted L. Now our key would be what? Well, if we wanted to use a lambda, we would say lambda x return x zero, right? And so this will sort it according to the first element of each one. So that's perfectly fine, but you can also use the operator module. You can use now the key. So what do we want? Well, in this case, we want items, right? We want the item at position zero. So we want to use the item getter function and we want item getter zero. So when we do that, we get the exact same result. So lastly, I want to look at calling callables again. Now we've seen that already before in this class. Remember we defined this class. I'm going to copy this code. We'll reuse this. And then we were able to call the test method by using the dot notation. But we did the same thing by basically extracting it using attribute getter into, you know, this third element of the tuple. So let me just clean that up a little bit, make it a little clearer. Okay, so here's my class. And now I'm going to say obj equals an instance of my class. And I'm going to say operator dot attribute getter. We're going to retrieve the test attribute. I'm going to call this f, right? That's now the test method that was bound to whatever is going to be passed into f. So now f of obj is returning what? It's returning that bound test method, just like we saw before. So now I need to call it. I need to do it this way. So test method running. So alternatively, if we want to call it at the same time, instead of using this kind of more convoluted syntax, we can use the operator method caller. Right. And so what do we want? We want to call the test method. Now this is going to be a callable, right? So this is going to return a callable that expects what? Well, it still needs to know the object, right? So now we can call f of object and that will actually run this test method as opposed to just returning it, which is what attribute getter did, right? When we said f of object, we actually got the method back here. When we say f of object, because we use method caller, basically Python put in this thing and actually called the method for us. Okay. Now, you can also pass in parameters, extra parameters. Let's say that this method here, test, requires an extra parameter. Then that might be a problem. How are you going to pass that in? And let's see what I mean by that. So let's go ahead and we have this test method. And let's say it needs another um, parameter. And then in here, what are we going to print? We're going to print self.a, self.b, um, well, here, let me change that as well. So now this class will only have two properties, A and B, and then we'll print C, okay? So if we run all this again, get rid of all this. Now we can say obj.a, right? That's 10. Object B's property is 20. And now if we call object.test, it needs an extra parameter. If we call it just this way, it says, no, no, you need an extra parameter. So let's say we call it with 100, then you can see it printed out 10 and 20, which was the built-in A and B, and 100 as well. <clears throat> so let's say now that we want to do this, what, what, it, what we did here, calling this method, but using the method caller function in the operator module. How would we do that? Well, let's try it. Let's say that we say operator dot method caller. We want to call test and we're going to call it on the object. Okay. So because object is the instance of my class. But if we do that, right, we're going to get the same error that we had before. It requires one, there's one missing required positional argument. We didn't provide it C. How do we do it? Where do we pass it? Well, method caller is nice about it. It's going to take it right here. So if I put in 100, then we're going to get what we had before, 10, 20, 100. So basically, it's going to take any arguments here. Let's say I had C and D, right? So if I have that, 
and we redo this, then here I've got to pass in 100, 200. I need two values now. We get that, and I can achieve the same result using it this way. So that works as well. Now, of course, what happens if you have this? And then we'll print E as well. So how would we call this one? Well, we need to pass in the two positionals, the mandatory and their positionals, so 10 and 200. And here, however, we have a mandatory key keyword argument, E. So we have to say E equals, let's say, 300. So when we do that, we get 10, 20, 100, 200, 300. How about method caller? How would we do that there? Well, very simply, E equals 300. So method caller is going to gather up an arbitrary number of arguments. So basically, it's looking at star args and star star quags, right? And it's going to collect those and then pass them out to this method here. So when we run that, we get the same thing. And of course, you know, we looked at method caller, but we also looked earlier at the attribute getter. So if we do it this way, right, let's say f equals operator dot attribute getter test. Okay. So if we do that, if we now say f of object, we get this. Now we need to call it, right? So if we call it, it tells us, hey, you can't. You're missing at least two positional required arguments C and D. It hasn't even realized that we're also missing the keyword only argument. So how might you do it? Well, you could do here, right? But now it says, oh, we need E as well. So go ahead and say E equals 100. And you've got the same thing again. But when you're using method caller, remember, it calls the method right away. So here you can delay passing in the parameters until after attribute getter has come back with its callable. Here you can't. So it will take it in, though, as extra parameters and pass them through. So that's quite neat. So if you want more information on that, then certainly you can look at the uh, documentation, the built-in, you can do a help, you can do a dir, but I also suggest just going to this um, link right here. Uh, it has a lot of really useful information on these standard operators as functions in the operator module, and it's pretty complete. There's a lot of information there. Um, I suggest you look at that as well. All right, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.